Okay. Thank you everybody for coming to Regional Pharmacy Journal Club today. Um, for our November speaker, we have Karen McCurdy Thompson, who is an oncology pharmacist in Moncton, for those of you that don't know her, and she's a past member of our pharmacy education committee. Um, so we thought we would build on the topic of biosimilars. So Denise Campo has given a great intro talk to what they are back in March. Um, so Karen's going to walk us through a trial that was done in oncology about a biosimilar product being used there and um, give us some tips to a real life practice scenario. So I'll hand it over to you, Karen. Thank you, Heather. Um, is everything okay with respect to my voice? Yes. Yeah, good. Great. Okay, because sometimes I get a little loud and if I go too fast, somebody tell me to slow down. Okay. So thank you for inviting me to talk to you today about this uh, particular trial. However, since I wasn't quite sure what our knowledge of biosimilars was overall, I uh, started uh, with a little quiz, but I have no conflicts of interest uh, for today's presentation. And but I have used Amgen, uh, the uh, manufacturer of the biosimilar that we'll be talking about in the study. Uh, they have given me permission to use their slides, which are far better than what I could have reproduced. So first of all, we know that biologics, biosimilars, they're all manufactured using living cells. And they're a very complex, highly molecular structure. They're, they're certainly uh, not easy to manufacture whatever format they are, a reference product or a biosimilar. So the quiz will start now, and you can guess true or false. Each batch of a biologic is identical to the last. You don't have to yell, but you can kind of think of it in your mind. Okay, time is up, Jeopardy. <laughs> it's impossible to guarantee that every batch of a biologic will be identical to the last one, which means that all the biologics have a slight variation. So whether it be a biosimilar or whether it be the true innovator drug, they can all have a slight variation. The biosimilars are the same as generic drugs. True or false? of course, because your generic drugs are done by uh, manufactured using a chemical process that creates identical copies. And your generic drugs are very small molecules, uh, easy, easier to process than what a biologic or a biosimilar drug is. And just recently I was listening to something somewhere, I uh, can't recall where, but I happened to Somebody happened to say, oh, well, just think of them as generic drugs. And I believe I almost jumped off the chair <laughs> because, no, they're not generic drugs. So we don't want to make that mistake uh, when uh, people talk to us about them. Uh, number three, biosimilars are highly similar to the reference product. True or false? True. Yes, and this is the key definition of the biosimilar, is that it is a highly similar to the reference products as long as it's as safe, as pure, and as potent as the reference products for the conditions in which it plans uh, to be used in. So no matter if you read the uh, European uh, definition or WHO definition, uh, you're going to say that it's highly similar, and that's the key word there. The reference product and the biosimilar may have some minor differences, true or false. True, that one is. Um, and it just basically with respect to the clinically inactive components, but as long as these different inactive components have no effect on the effectiveness of the biosimilar, its safety, its uh, immun immunogenicity. And patients who receive biosimilars must have the same physical response as with the reference product. True or false? True. Okay. Uh, again, that's the, the key here is that the biosimilar must have no clinically meaningful difference with the reference product and that the manufacturer does this by comparing, uh, going through a rigorous uh, series of trials and analysis, uh, making sure that the immunogenicity, the pharmacokinetics, the pharmacodynamics are all equivalent to that of the reference product. 
So this little picture here is just kind of a clinical trial comparison. So when the original uh, uh, manufacturer of a biologic, um, you'll see if you're on the left-hand side of your screen, their main goal is to determine the clinical effect, the safety of their product. Whereas when we're working with biosimilar development, where our main goal is to establish similarity to the reference product, so the process to get it to market is a little bit different. So in the analytical phase, uh, they're looking at the physiochemical properties of the drug to create sameness to the biological product. So about its ionization, about its purity, about its um, isotericism, uh, maybe the permeability, the solubility. Then they go to the preclinical, and here they're doing functional studies to determine the biological function. So the mode of action is the biologic equivalent or the same as the biosimilar, or I should say the biosimilar, the same as the biologic. Then we go into another uh, group of studies uh, for the pharmacokinetics, the pharmacodynamics, which is done in humans. And again, this is where we kind of determine the bioequivalence of the product. And then we go on to phase three trials, which are done in humans. And um, they, again, are determining the safety and efficacy of the drug as compared to the biologic. So it's just kind of a reverse. They say there in between those two uh, triangles that the world is kind of turned up upside down. So it's still a rigorous process. However, there are some considerations that when they're doing, you know, not totally different than a, an originator drug, uh, but some of the things that they'll might uh, look at a little bit differently when they're doing a trial design is that they have to be done the indication for the drug. And you want to do that in a very sensitive population. And by that, I mean a population that will detect any meaningful differences um, fairly easily and fairly promptly in the course of the disease, okay? So in the case we're going to be talking about today, we're talking about the drug Bevacizumab. Mostly we think of that in terms of colon cancer, but the colon cancer population is not a very sensitive population, whereas a lung cancer patient is somewhat more easily to detect any changes, any difference in the availability of the products. So we want to do them in similar populations. Um, we, of course, want to look at any, as we do in all, everything we pretty well do in pharmacy, we look at the patient's well-being, what other uh, comorbid states that they have, what other medications they've been on, they're on currently or in the past, and, of course, the severity of their, their diagnosis. It has to be a similar route of administration, uh, and are we using it as a single treatment in combination, and are we comparing it to the standard of care? We're looking at the endpoints, and when we're looking at endpoints in um, uh, um, biosimilar trials, we're more, look, more or less looking for activity, like maybe a response rate, as compared to um, uh, co compared to a, a, an endpoint uh, like something like overall survival, um, because it, we're just trying to determine that the products are cl clinically equivalent, uh, so they should be relevant. They should be accessible and sensitive to detect any differences. And most of the time, they would be uh, the endpoints would be similar to that that's been used in the original biologic trial. However, they could be somewhat different. But as long as we know what we're, we're monitoring and we're looking for. Um, they talk about continuous endpoints, maybe more sensitive. So when we talk about continuous endpoints, we might be thinking of something. Uh, it's a, a measurement that's used in trials that's expressed in terms of a number. So maybe we're looking at how many times uh, the patients had pleural effusion, how many times drainage has had to occur over a period of time, or in a non-cancer patient, the blood pressure over a period of a few months. Whereas in a category Categorical endpoint, we're looking at tumor response, a complete response, uh, uh, a partial response, um, and we can only fit into one category there. You'll look at the duration of the study. Um, it should be long enough to detect any differences in, in any of the properties of the product that we're interested in. And what type of study would be best for these? Uh, we're actually comparing uh, a biological province head to a biological product head to head with the biosimilar product, which is really nice. Um, and so we're kind of looking at a, a, an equivalent study um, in these types of cases to determine the, the clinical similarity better. And I can remember when I was on 
coder, and uh, we'd, we'd look at trials for lung or for whatever cancer we happen to be talking about those days, and we'd, we'd say, well, okay, this study was started five years ago, but since that time, when they started the study, maybe they were comparing it to the standard of care, but in that five years, the standard of care has now changed. So it was always a big issue or a big concern that we're not really comparing this now to the standard of care. And uh, I'm sure that happens in, in all disease states and chronic diseases. But that was one of the things that used to uh, work up quite a, a discussion for us. The other thing that we should be familiar with when we're looking at biosimilarity trials is totality of evidence. And this is a word that you'll see no matter what article you read. Um, and I just wanted to review it here. Um, it's a, the, the, so the drugs have a similar distinct pathway. It's a rigorous pathway. Um, and totality of evidence means that they've, it's the concept that requires that the structural, the functional, the non-clinical and clinical data are all uh, acquired in a very stepwise approach, similar to our, our triangle we showed earlier. Uh, they demonstrate that no meaningful differences in the safety, quality, or efficacy of the observed compared with the reference product. And it's only when all of these criteria have met uh, that the, the drug is approved as a biosimilar product. Um, it also, the phase three comparability trials, so remember we said at the end it, it was the phase three trials, and these are done, perhaps there's some uncertainties that we uh, remain regarding the safety of the biosimilar relative to the reference product, even though we've theoretically established it to be bioequivalent beforehand. And also, though, it could also detect some concerns for the reference product, which might require the reference product to be studied a little bit further. Clinical equivalency trials should demonstrate that the proposed biosimilar is neither decreased nor increased activity relative to its reference product. So we don't want it to be better, we don't want it to be worse, we want it considered to be equivalent. And uh, like I mentioned earlier, they have a stringent head-to-head -head comparison with the reference product. Other terminology that you will have as we go through the study today, uh, it is an equivalent study that we'll be looking at, and it's intended to demonstrate the product is not inferior, the product is not superior, but the product is equivalent. In other words, we want to reject the null hypothesis to say that the, that the products are equivalent and one is, uh, one is no better or no worse than the other. And then you're going to hear about equivalence margins or pre-specified margins. And this is defined as the largest difference that is clinically acceptable between the test drug and the active control that will detect any meaningful differences. So when we look in our study, we're going to talk about the pre-specified margins. So the parameters or the study results have to fall within that particular margin um, in order for it to be considered uh, bioequivalent. And, um, the, if you choose the right margin, it will provide assurance that the test product is not substantially inferior. And they come at this pre-specified margin or equivalence margins. What they do, uh, they've looked at a, a meta-analysis of all the placebo-controlled randomized trials of the bio-originator drug. And this is how they come up with this value. And it's usually equal on both sides. So right here, we have a little picture to show that. You can see the dotted line on the left-hand side is the equivalence, lower bound of the equivalence margin, and that our top line does not cross that equivalence margin line, whereas the bottom one does. So therefore, our top product would be considered biosimilar because it falls within the appropriate range at a 90% confidence interval. So moving to our study, it's called the MAPLE study. I don't know why it's called the MAPLE study. That hit me last night and I wondered why. I couldn't find anything. So if anybody has bright ideas, I'm more than welcome to hear you, hear you out. Uh, but it talked about the efficacy and safety of the biosimilar ABP215 compared with bevacizumab in patients with advanced non-squamous 
non-small cell lung cancer, and it was a randomized, double-blinded phase three study. Now, this study started in November the 11th. I thought it was kind of funny starting on a Remembrance Day, probably in the States, that would be why. November the 11th, 2013, and the study finished on July the 23rd, 2015. And there were 101 sites across the, the world. And uh, there was one Canadian site, and that one Canadian site was here at the Moncton Hospital. Dr. Abdel Salam told me uh, that we were the ones in Canada that was on this uh, study. And if you look at the statistics Canada for lung cancer, between 2011 and 2015, up almost 50% of lung cancer patients were diagnosed with stage 4 disease. And this is the, the stage that we'll be looking at in this study. So I was kind of surprised to see that many people with that advanced uh, um, stage of lung cancer at time of diagnosis. Um, and, you know, does this equate to the population that we serve? So, something for us to think about. So in the study, the primary objective was to assess the efficacy of Mavaza, which is the um, biosimilar product uh, product name, compared to Bev Asusumab reference product, and I'll probably just say Bev from here on in, in patients with non-squamous, non-small cell lung cancer, receiving first-line chemo with carbo and paclitaxel, and their primary analysis or primary endpoint was uh, best overall response rate. So they were looking at complete or partial response, so kind of a categorical endpoint. And it was uh, based on central radiology evaluation, the, the outcomes, and these were independent. Uh, they had the pre-specified margin um, at 0.67 to 1.5. So we talked about the equivalence margin, the pre-specified margin. For this particular study, it is that 0.67 to the 1.5. And you had the 90% confidence uh, interval uh, for response rate and that it had to be in that uh, pre-specified similarity margin. I'm just going to take a drink, excuse me. Mm. So the endpoints, the risk ratio of overall response rate, and then the secondary endpoints, risk difference of the uh, overall response, progression-free duration of response. Basically, we're going to talk about the primary endpoint, and at the end, I have a few slides uh, from Angem on the results of the secondary endpoints. We'll talk a little bit about the side effects of these drugs, um, mention overall survival, and uh, if we have time, we'll do this post hoc analysis, uh, but we may not have time, but if anybody wants to know, they can certainly contact me or whatever. So the inclusion criteria for the study was stage four or re, um, recurrent metastatic non-squamous non-small cell lung cancer and they had to be initiating the first line of carboplatin and paclitaxel uh, they had to have measurable disease according to resist so in other words on a ct scan uh, the um, lesions of the nodes had to be greater than 10 millimeters. Uh, anything less than that is considered non-measurable. Uh, they had to have an ECOG performance of 0 or 1, so they're in pretty good, pretty good uh, shape. And uh, they had to have, of course, adequate bone marrow, hepatic, and renal function, which is common for most studies, and irregardless of what disease we're talking about. And they had to have a life expectancy of greater than six months. And then I threw in a couple of extra things there just so I wouldn't forget. <laughs> the patient had to be 18 years uh, or greater, uh, but less than 80. And if they were a patient that was um, um, stratified or randomized, if they had a recurrent disease, they had to have had at least 12 months uh, since completing previous chemotherapy. So they had to have a year interval. And they did baseline CAT scans and MRIs of the chest and abdomen, had to be done within 28 days uh, of randomization to just check what the disease burden is. Uh, and once they were randomized, the carbo and the paclitaxel had to begin within eight days of randomization. And they hoped that the patients would at least receive four cycles of treatment. So quite a, uh, quite a, a number of inclusion criteria. 
And the exclusion, um, small cell lung cancer was not included. Uh, patients that had any uh, brain mets, unless it was under control. Um, malignancy, other than non-small cell, within five years. So if they had another cancer within five years, they weren't allowed to be entered. And they couldn't have any major surgery uh, planned during the treatment phase. Patients were randomized in a one-to-one. -one. It was an inter uh, interactive uh, voice uh, response system. And they were to receive either the uh, biosimilar APB215 or the bevacizumab, 15 milligram per kilogram. And do note that that's almost twice or three times the dose that we'd use in colon cancer. Administered every 21 days for six cycles. And um, the patients all received carbo and paclitaxel every 21 days for greater or equal to four or less or equal to six cycles. And the carboplatin was um, a fairly high dose, an area under the curve dosing of six, and the paclitaxel was 200 milligram per meter squared, which again is a fairly adequate dose of paclitaxel. Um, the, uh, it's the same as the bevacizumab product. Uh, the first infusion of the biosimilar was given over 90 minutes, if no complications or sensitivity reactions. The second was done over 60, and if no issues, then they continued on for subsequent treatments at 30 minutes. The patients were uh, maintained on the treatment phase until 21 days after their last dose of uh, investigational or, or product or study-specified chemotherapy. And they were followed for disease progression and overall survival after completing the end of the last treatment visit till the end of the study, until they had to withdraw, or they had lost to follow up, or they happened to die, or uh, they had to have other therapy. And the randomization was stratified by geographic region, uh, Eastern versus Western versus Asia versus North America. Um, there wasn't a whole lot. It was mostly a Caucasian population from what I can tell. Um, in, uh, in the groups, they did specify numbers which were Asian or which were um, uh, African, but they, they weren't large numbers at all. So here we have our famous diagram of the outline, the study design, uh, basically what I just said in the previous two slides about the performance status, the inclusion criteria, the randomization, from screening to randomization, it was less than four weeks, their treatment phase was 18 weeks, and at the end of the study and the follow-up time. And, and uh, so basically nothing new for me to mention there, it's just kind of a Kind of a pretty slide. <laughs> now, here we have kind of the patient disposition, and my next slide will be a little bit clearer for you. This is a busy one, I do realize. But we had, uh, there were 328 patients in the biosimilar uh, group, and there was 314 uh, into the BEV group. And uh, we see that um, 40% of those in the biosimilar had to be discontinued. The reasons are listed there. Um, the next slide will have a little bit better. And that the people, um, there was 192 completed all the planned doses of the, invest, uh, the biosimilar product. Um, so that's not too, too bad. Um, and those treated with, taxol, with paclitaxel and with carboplatin, it was about 55% of them completed all their planned treatments. As compared to the bevacizumab group or the BEV group with the carbo and taxol, only 35% of them ended up being discontinued and about 60% completed all their, their uh, cycles. So a little bit higher values there. But this is this slide that's a little bit better perhaps to see um, that my concerns with this slide were in particular where you see the reasons for discontinuation uh, um, patient requests, death, of course, physician decision. There's nowhere where it really kind of said decision uh, why the doctors decided, but I presume it was maybe because of adverse effects. Um, because most, they do make a general statement uh, that most of the, the patients dis discontinued treatment or whatever because of adverse effects the majority of the time. Um, so overall, uh, the results are pretty, pretty comparable, uh, a little bit higher with respect to patient requests, and um, not too, too much difference otherwise. Um, 
if if Doug Ducet is listening, I always remember <laughs> Doug at coming uh, years ago when I started here at the hospital. He came and he did a talk on like studies and looking at studies and numbers to treat and all that. And I remember Doug always saying, "Your numbers have to add up." So one of the first things I do now, Doug, is make sure my numbers add up. <laughs> um, now the baseline demographics was. Um, age uh, less than 65, greater than 65, very comparable there. There's uh, the weight. Um, we, when they did a sensitivity analysis, they also considered a little bit about weight loss in the previous six months. They looked at, at um, uh, molecular genetics uh, type of things. Um, so um, their weights, nothing too, too serious there. But what I thought was a little bit different was when we come down to the smoking status, um, we have never smokers in the Mavazi group at, say, 20%, whereas we almost have 24% in the BEV group. Whether that makes a difference or not is hard to say. Um, and also, when we look at the current smokers, we have more in the Mavazi group versus uh, less in the BEV group. Um, so something for us to keep in mind, perhaps. Um, now, the staging, we said they had to be a stage four or a recurrent metastatic disease. So when you see here the stage four, there was 309 in the Mavazi, 290 in the BEV group. So a couple points difference there. And the recurrent disease, again, almost the same uh, same difference, about 1.8, I believe it works out to. Um, and um, we ECOG performance, again, zero or one. So just the, the characteristics of the population, uh, mostly considered to be similar. Um, for statistics, uh, it was a 90% power in order to uh, determine the equivalence between the products and that safety margin of 0.67 to 1.5. Um, they, they took the trough concentrations of the drugs, were similar at various points throughout the study. And at week 19, at the end of the study, the concentrations of the Mavazi versus the, uh, the uh, Bevsusumab were very similar. So this is what it's, when we're doing the bioequivalent studies, all of this stuff is very important because we've got to make sure that the drug um, works in the, the same way um, as it does in the originator population, the originator product population as well. Um, when you read about this stuff, they, they, they say very many times that, you know, uh, we have to detect this, we have to do this step, we have to prove that it's equivalent, we have to prove that the mode of action is the same. And uh, so seem to be very, very conscientious of all that. Um, just a little bit of miscellaneous data. Uh, we had a few more uh, patients uh, completing the bevacizumab group uh, of, of at least six doses. Um, we had doses that were held at least once, a little bit more in the bevacizumab group, um, and um, that was there was no real reason. Most of the times, it was because of side effects. Um, Dose interruptions, carbo doses, very, very similar in the number of the carbo and paclitaxel doses in both groups. And the mean number of doses in each uh, were approximately 4.8 versus 5. So comparable there. I don't think there's anything that stands out too much. But here we come. So our primary endpoint being the best overall response. And we had two complete responses in each of the groups. And we had partial responses at 38% versus 41% in the originator uh, product group, a little bit higher. Um, we had a lot with stable disease, comparable. Um, with progression-free survival, very comparable. Again, remember that was a secondary endpoint. And the overall survival, um, was again um, very, very comparable in these groups. So our um, overall response rate, 38 versus 41%. Now, here is another picture explaining the primary endpoint. Um, so we have the confidence interval, but yet when we look at the response rate and the risk ratio, it falls calculation 0.93 
So it falls within the 90% confidence interval and it falls within that pre-specified margin. So therefore, they feel very confident in that we can consider the products are, uh, that are bioequivalent. Not inferior, not, uh, not inferior, not superior, but bioequivalent. The totality of evidence. Um, if we look at the secondary uh, endpoints, again, the risk difference, uh, minus 2.9, um, the uh, progressions free survival uh, was also the hazard ratio there is 1.03, so that's that's good. That's what we like to see. Um, very comparable for both products, and the duration of uh, response again a little over five months for each group. That's good, and the the uh, deaths uh, percentage of deaths similar in both groups. They. Some of the deaths they claimed, they didn't give a complete outline, but some of them was from hemoptysis. Um, it's, um, there was a, another reason why, oh, a GI perforation, which is common side effects of anti-VEGF uh, toxicities. There's the, your uh, graph of your progressions-free uh, survival um, with our hazard ratio being, uh, being within what we like to see when we're doing a bioequivalent study. Duration of response, again, just in the average about 5.6, 5.8, uh, 5 um, and overall survival, as long as they follow the patients. The other thing that's important when we're looking at these um, biosimilars or biological products is the anti-drug antibodies formation and we we don't want those there because they could inactivate our our product uh, so there were uh, binding antibody positive uh, there was four of them in our Mavazi group and seven in our other group and transient binding antibodies which just means that the last time that the patient had been checked, they weren't there, so they had only developed over a very short period of time, uh, but caused no harm, but nobody actually proved positive for a neutralizing antibodies. So we don't have, we, they, didn't, they weren't concerned, they didn't have to do any more uh, checking on that. So in, again, the immunogenicity was equivalent. There was no harm or no uh, extra precautions that needed to be taken because one was more so than the other. Um, now into the adverse effects, of course, every study has adverse effects. Um, and um, the, um, Again, mostly your VEGF toxicities, um, there was greater than grade three adverse effects, 49, 43 versus 44%. Serious adverse effects a little bit higher in the Mavazi group. And uh, there was uh, fatalities, there was um, four versus 3.6. So there was actually 24 fatalities in total, 13 in the Mavazi and 11 in the Bevsusimab group. And uh, not a whole lot of discontinuation uh, because of the adverse effects, 18 versus 17 percent, or 19 versus 17. Um, similar here, I, uh, this graph here is mostly the, the GI perforation, the hypertension, which we do see uh, with our uh, products, um, and proteinuria, no big, no big change there. This product, Mavazi, um, it it has to be the same as bevsusimab. If we had surgery, we have to wait at least a month for surgery. Um, um, it, once surgery is completed, in order to start the Mavazi product as well, um, as as um, w we would if if we were using bevsusimab in colon cancer. Um, the study limitations, uh, perhaps the choice of response rate as primary endpoint, um, but again, remember we talked about endpoints and we're not looking to determine safety and efficacy of the product. We, we want to find an endpoint where we can determine if, um, if our, our products are equivalent enough to elicit a similar response. So that uh, there was a little bit of discussion in the article about that, but they still felt that the response rate was the right type for this particular type of trial, and that they didn't do a maintenance phase, but then what more would the maintenance phase prove about the bioequivalency of the product? Probably not. Uh, not a lot was their, their conclusion for that. So 
in other words, in the discussion part, we sh the study seemed to prove that the products were clinically uh, equivalent uh, in terms of their mode of action, uh, their pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics in the body, uh, their immunogenicity, um, and that it had no more these adverse effects, serious adverse effects that reported were very similar and uh, that no patients had any neutralizing, uh, developed any neutralizing antibodies. Now, I, if uh, we have time, oh yeah. Uh, so just as far as cost comparison would go, um, we know that um, none of these biological products are cheap, and the whole goal of getting biosimilars on the market is to try to in prove the accessibility uh, to people for these products, whether it be cancer or, or ulcerative colitis or whatever the, the disease may be. So by using a, a product originator versus the biosimilar, there would probably uh, be quite, quite a saving of about $1,200 or $1,300 difference um, if we did that. And some of the pharmacy pearls for those in attendance. Um, there's been no formal drug interactions um, with this product. They do know that it doesn't interact with 5-FU, of course, carbo or paclitaxel, um, but not a lot of other things have been shown yet as far as drug interactions. Um, there's nothing to do if the renal or, or uh, hepatic uh, function is in somewhat impaired. There's no adjustment dosing necessary so far at this point in time that we know. The product has to be kept in the fridge. Of course, it shouldn't be frozen. It should not be shaken, any of these amino acid products. And it has to be protected from light. And it doesn't have any antimicrobial preservatives, so stability um, can be somewhat uh, limited. Um, the ideal world would be you mix it, you use it immediately. Um, the micromedics suggest that you can keep it for eight hours um, Dilution has taken place in control and validated aseptic conditions uh, uh, at room temperature. It shouldn't be combined with dextrose solutions. It has a very long half-life, as do most of these biologics. Um, it is excreted some by renal as well, and the volume of distribution is the body in the body is about 2.9 liters. Now, the other thing that I'm noticing on one of my cancer groups is people. I, I mean, we're we're probably. I shouldn't say, but we're probably not going to be switching from the originator product to the biosimilar um, in our patients. It will start new patients. However, there was a question going around about the rate of infusion. So they were the question they were asking was: so the patients had two uh, of the originator and were down to the 30-minute infusion. Would you automatically start your biosimilar product at the 30-minute infusion, or would you start it back at the 90-minute infusion? So if it ever come to that point in time, maybe that's something that we'll have to make a, 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 an educated evaluation on as well. Uh, the responses, there was only a few responses. Some start all over again at the new rate if they're changing them. Others just continue on. So it was a 50-50 hodgepodge of, of answers to that question. So it looks like we're probably going to be going into the area. Um, we have to feel confident in the use of these products that they are biosimilar and that they are highly similar to the reference product. Um, and the only way we're going to know that is by attending seminars, reading the literature, reading the information. And the practitioner has to know as well. Um, the, the doctor, if they're going to talk to the patient, um, they have to be if the patient said, oh, would you use that on your mother? Would you use that on your wife? You have to be ready to say yes or no. So we need to understand the products. Um, we, we know that the Provincial NB Cancer Network is uh, working on this uh, project. I um, believe Glenn in our department is, is uh, working on that as well, very interested in that. Um, patient's knowledge and comfort of use, they have to um, feel comfortable in using the product. We don't want patients to think that they're a secondhand product or that they're a generic or that they can't, that it, it just because it's less expensive that they, um, you know, that they're getting a, a second grade product. So we don't want our patients to feel like that and that's not what we're doing. 
uh, hospital formulary uptake. That will be something that will eventually happen for sure. And that's my favorite fall scene off of the web. <laughs> so if there's any questions, I have my cheat notes here. I will try to answer the questions. Um, and if not, I thank you for your time. And if you have any comments or feedback, I'd certainly be happy to, um, to listen. So thank you very much. Any questions? Thank you, Karen. Do we have any questions for Karen and St. John? No. No questions here. Um, what about at St. Joe's? No, no questions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and Mira Mishi? Um, Krista in Sussex, do you have any questions for Karen? Um, any questions from Bathurst? Quite a bunch today, Karen. Yes. <laughs> I need all those cheat notes. <laughs> Does anybody in Moncton have questions for you? Well, thank so, you very much again. Yeah. So, how like the how how do you feel about it all, Heather? Like the biosimilar process of manufacturing and the decision making and stuff. Um, it, like you had kind of have a a good attitude toward them, or or what? Where do you see us going in the future? I think it's probably the way of the future when you look at it, I think from a financial mm. perspective, and I'm glad they're doing the trials to make sure that things are bioequivalent. Yeah. And I know in the nephrology world, there was a lot of hesitation with the mm. gluten stimulating agent, because back in the 90s, there was that, I forget what it was called, yeah. the P something, where the red blood cell aplasia yeah. was with certain products. So yeah. you know, in Europe, they've done a lot of trials with the yeah. gluten <clears throat> biosimilars, and so far, the results have been promising, and a lot of sites there have switched. So yeah, yeah. There's a lot. It seems to be in, when you read the articles a lot on like the rheumatology side or on the uh, ulcerative colitis and stuff, the infleximibs and stuff like that. And not there's lots in oncology, uh, but more complete studies or long-term product use more in the other chronic uh, rheumatic diseases or uh, autoimmune diseases. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and they all seem to report good outcomes and good results, so, it, you know, but, uh, and, and one thing too is we can extrapolate, the, the companies don't have to do something for every disease they want it for, they can extrapolate. And with Bevsusamab, just as one note, I thought maybe somebody might ask if we could use it, like, for the, um, um, intravitreal or for eye use and it's not indicated for that but that's the we wouldn't we wouldn't use this when people come to our eye clinic and want it for their uh, um, uh, uh, macular degeneration or whatever type of thing so anyway okay everybody well thank you very much thank you Heather oh thanks guys um, so those on Skype if you guys have anybody joining you if you don't mind just emailing me with the number of people that were with you yeah, I'm going to try okay. and send out the evaluation today or tomorrow. We've been having issues, issues with our survey software. If I can't get it to work, I'll just give everybody a CE for yeah. Okay. Um, so we'll be back at the end of November for the pharmacy residents. Um, they're going to introduce us to their residency project. So I encourage people to come on out. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.